Our last uh, carol this evening, uh, we will be taking up an offering. Uh, the offering this year, 50% is going to church general funds, uh, but all 50% is, uh, is going to a charity called the Home of Blessing, which is associated with uh, the parents of, of, of nice bowers. Andrew uh, has been our worship group leader. Andrew Bowers has been our worship group leader here for a number of years, and and Andrew and Nice are accepting God's call to go to work in Thailand, um, Nice's homeland. And we hope that the offering this evening towards um, the home of blessing, uh, the charity that it's Nice's parents that operate it, isn't it? That that will be the beginning of an ongoing relationship between us and Andrew and Nice as they move forward in this call of the Lord. Do we have any slides about the house of blessing? The home of blessing. This is uh, the work that is bringing hope to um, single girls who have fallen on difficult times, if I can put it that way. And it's a very, very holy and important work as these girls receive the hope that Jesus brings to their lives. In the new carol that we've just sung this evening from the squalor of a borrowed stable, Jesus is known as Emmanuel. And this uh, name comes from the Bible, from Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, where an angel says to Joseph, in a dream, that the baby to be born to Mary is the fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy from Isaiah 7 verse 14. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And the magnificent reading that we've just heard from John chapter 1 is recognized as one of the most profound pieces of philosophical writing in the whole of history. It attempts to put into words what the early Christians believed about Jesus, that he is the Word, God himself, who became one of us when he was made flesh, born as a baby in Bethlehem. Paul, St. Paul, also writes about what Jesus did in coming into the world in one of his letters in Philippians chapter 2, where he says this to the church, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be held on to, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. This is the good news, that God loved us so much that he came into the world himself to save us. We call this the incarnation. Don't know if you enjoy chili con carne, but carne is a Latin word which means flesh, meat. And when we talk about the incarnation, we're talking about God becoming flesh. So the birth of Jesus means that God became human. In uh, verse 6 of that reading that I read from Philippians, where Jesus humbles himself, being truly God, to becoming human, there is the tremendous humility of God exhibited. It's lovely that God does not remain aloof and distant and far away, but comes into the world to save us, becoming one of us. That is actually the true message of Christmas, that God loves us, that he came into the world to be our savior. Yet so many people prefer Santa to Jesus. I wonder if you've noticed how the how many of the attributes of God 
Je that Jesus gives up in the incarnation, in becoming human, we have given to Santa. Now, I'm indebted to the anonymous researchers who came up with the following information. You may la like to take notes. First, omniscience, that is all-knowing. God is all-knowing. But according to the story of Christmas, so is Santa. There are approximately 2 billion children in the world. 378 million live in countries where Santa is known. The average number of children per household in those countries is 3.5, making a total of 108 million homes, presuming there is one good child in each. According to the story, Santa knows where every single one of them is. Now that's omniscience. Second, omnipotence. God is, sorry, om, second, omnipresence. I must get these in the right order. Omnipresence. God is omnipresent. But so, according to the Santa story, is Santa. Santa has about 31 hours of Christmas to work with, given different time zones, and assuming he travels east to west, this works out to 967 visits per second. That's to say he has about one thousandth of a second to park the sleigh, hop down the chimney, fill the stockings, eat whatever snacks have been left for him, get back up the chimney and ride on. Assuming the houses are evenly spaced, we're talking about a distance of 0.78 miles per visit, making a total journey of 75.5 million miles. This means the sleigh is moving at 650 miles per second, or 3,000 times the speed of sound, which is how Santa appears to be everywhere at the same time. Third, omnipotence, which of course means all-powerful. God is obviously all-powerful, but so is Santa, according to the Santa story. The payload of the sleigh is enormous. Assuming that each child gets nothing more than a medium-sized Lego set, about two pounds, the sleigh is carrying over 500,000 tons, not counting Santa himself. On land, a reindeer can, I understand, pull no more than 300 pounds. Even granting that the flying reindeer could pull 10 times the normal amount, Santa would need 360,000 of them. This huge herd in itself increases the payload another 540 Th sorry, 554,000 tons, or roughly seven times the weight of the Queen Elizabeth. That's the ship, not the monarch. <laughs> so we have 600,000 tons traveling at 650 miles per second, which would create enormous air resistance. This would heat up the reindeer in the same fashion as a spacecraft re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. The lead pair of reindeer would absorb 14.3 quintillion joules of energy per second each. They would almost instantaneously combust, exposing the reindeer behind them and creating sonic booms in their wake. The entire reindeer team would be vaporized within 4.26 thousandths of a second, or about the same time as Santa reached the fifth house on his trip. Not that it matters, since Santa, as a result of accelerating from a dead stop to 650 miles per second in a thousandth of a second, would be subjected to a force equivalent to 17,500 Gs. A 17-stone Santa would be pinned to the back of the sleigh by 4,315,000 pounds of force instantly crushing his bones and organs and reducing him to a quivering blob of pink goo. 
Only an omnipotent Santa could achieve such a task. Obviously, the idea of Santa that people hold today does not make sense. But God coming into the world to save us in the person of his son, I think it makes a whole lot more sense. Why not we believe that our God is an all-powerful spirit, the most powerful being. He created the universe. He must have power beyond our imagining. But apparently, he is, with all that power, gentle and patient with us and loves us. Many people seem not to be interested, I guess, because they don't read the Bible and they misunderstand God and his motives. In the book, The Jesus I Never Knew, Philip Yancey wrote the following. He said, I learned about incarnation when I kept a salt water aquarium. Management of a marine aquarium, I discovered, is no easy task. I had to run a portable chemical laboratory to monitor the nitrate levels and the ammonia content. I pumped in vitamins and antibiotics and sulfur drugs and enough enzymes to make a rock grow. I filtered the water through glass fibers and charcoal and exposed it to ultraviolet light. You would think, in view of all the energy expended on their behalf, that my fish would at least be grateful. Not so. Every time my shadow loomed over the tank, they dove for cover into the nearest shell. They showed one emotion only, fear. Although I opened the lid and dropped in food on a regular schedule three times a day, they responded to each visit as a sure sign of my designs to torture them. I could not convince them of my true concern. To my fish, I was deity, a god. I was too large for them. My actions, too incomprehensible. My acts of mercy, they saw as cruelty. My attempts at healing, they viewed as destruction. To change their perceptions, I began to see, would require a form of incarnation. I would have to become a fish and speak to them in a language they could understand. That is what Jesus has done. He has come among us. That we should know what God is really like. He came, he became one of us himself. But Jesus was no superman. Philippians 2 tells us that Jesus made himself nothing. Actually, the word translated here means he emptied himself of his divine power. He was weak and vulnerable, just like we are. The mission in coming into the world was an incredible risk. The Gospels often reveal that Jesus was emotionally vulnerable and often tired. He wept at his friend's tomb. He was sometimes lonely and felt deserted by his friends. He left his position of ultimate power and became physically vulnerable. Just think, it would have been the end of the story if Herod had found that the baby Jesus among the young of Bethlehem. But he didn't. God had a different plan. Jesus had to make himself vulnerable in order to save us. It had to be costly. The most costly thing he could have done was to lay down all his rights and allow himself to be crucified, not for anything he had done wrong, but as a sacrifice which counted as a payment for all the sins of humanity through all ages. God counted this sacrifice as sufficient 
so that if we put our faith in him, we can be forgiven and brought into a wonderful relationship with God. And God proved that this sacrifice was pleasing to him by raising Jesus from the dead. What Jesus did, as David Watson once said, it was like your landlord becoming your lodger, like your managing director up before you for an interview, like Beethoven queuing up for a ticket to his own concert, like a headmaster getting the cane, like a good architect living in a slum built by a rival, like Picasso painting by numbers. God lived among us. The wonder of the Christmas story is that the most powerful being in the universe came to earth in vulnerability, that we might have the opportunity of knowing God forever and experience his heaven. As Jesus himself said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The eternal life he speaks of is a meaningful life in which we know the meaning of our existence, to have a perfectly fulfilling relationship with God forever. Jesus has made the way for us to know why we're here. Lots of people today are looking for answers. Answers to the meaning of life. And I think that because the church has not been clear enough about our message, they're looking elsewhere. The church needs to rise up and speak out the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ with clarity and to say that no substitute can be found for the love of God revealed in the incarnation, in Jesus' life that resulted in his sacrificial death that saves us and his resurrection from the dead which gives us hope of life beyond the grave. What a gift God has given us by becoming one of us. I hope you know what it is to have received this gift. Long ago, I gave up worrying about Christmas presents. When my family asked me what I want for Christmas, I say, oh, anything. In fact, I really wouldn't be bothered if I had nothing, really. Well, I might be a bit upset <laughs> looking at my wife. Because I think the most important thing is the greatest gift of all. If you've never received this gift, I want to say to you that it's available to you this Christmas. It really is. And it's not rocket science to explain what God has done to you, done for you, done for all of us in coming into the world. So if you want to find out, then please speak to me afterwards so I can help you to find Emmanuel, God with us. I do hope that you have a very happy Christmas. There's a lot of fun to be had at Christmas as we discovered at our home group last night playing Jenga and having a lovely time together singing carols and having a right old laugh. There is a lot of joy to be found in celebrating, but I want to say to you that the most important thing that you can receive this Christmas is a relationship with the infinite God who became human that we might know him.